Napa know. A Napa guy knows that by the foot, there's no better ride than an old station wagon. Room for six people facing forward, two people facing backward, and a whole lot of luggage, lumber, and bicycles haphazardly strapped to the roof. If you can parallel park that beast, you can park anything. And with some quality parts and a little Napa know-how, you can keep your land ship running longer, stronger. It's not obsolete. It's a rare treasure. That's Napa know-how. Napa know-how. Blog Talk Radio. Hi, and welcome to Linda's Lounge, A Journey of Self-Discovery. And today, we are going to be talking about the five agreements for the new relationship. With us, we have Alan Hard- Hardman, and he is the author and Tulloch Master, trained by Miguel Ruiz in the tradition of the Four Agreements. He teaches his version of the Tulloch Path in Sonoma County, California, and he guides journeys of the spirit to sacred sites in Mexico and beyond. He is also the co-author of two books with Deepak Chopra, Carolyn Meese, Dr. Andrew Wheel, and Prince uh, Charles, and others, and has recently published the Everything Tolik Wisdom book. And uh, at the end of the show, we will, uh, I'll give uh, Alan a, an opportunity to be able to share with you all the information on how you can get in touch with him um, to know about uh, information on his spiritual coaching journeys, teleclasses, and online programs, and wellness vacations, and a number he can be also reached at. Um, again, I invited him today to be on the show uh, to talk about the new relationship and its, the five uh, new agreements, so that we can use to com- that we can use this to completely heal and change our old fears and beliefs about love and relationship. Alan had just uh, completed a five-day Valentine's workshop. Valentine's workshop around love and relationship there in is it Chicala, Alan? Chicala, it's called yes, Linda. Okay, Chicala, where he's living now. So, with that, I just want to welcome Alan to the show. Thanks for joining us, Alan. Oh, it's great, Linda. Thanks for uh, inviting me, and I look forward to sharing. Yeah, I think this is a great um, topic. Um, as always, it's a, a very good topic, and I, I you know. Reading, I, I had actually found you through a link from someone else, and when I read the new five agreements, I was like, "Wow, that's interesting." Because I always, you know, you hear people say, after you've been married a while, you need to like redo a contract because things have changed. So, I think with things that are rapid, that are things are moving so rapidly, um, it seems now that this is such a perfect conversation to be having, along with other things, but. Um, but right now, I think this is a really good conversation to be having. So um, what I'd like to do is kind of ask you, how did you, because I, I actually had read the Four Agreements, so I know you were his, like, apprentice. You were trained by him. Yes. How did that come about? Oh, it was an accident, as they say. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had tried a lot of things. I've been a spiritual seeker, I guess we could call me, for many, many years, and tried meditating in Eastern philosophies and chanting in languages I didn't understand and and at the same time having a real love affair with Mexico. I've spent a lot of time in Mexico and that's where I'm living right now and talking to you from Chicala, a little village about 90 minutes north of Puerto Vallarta on the west coast of Mexico. So I have uh, I had this affinity for Mexico and I had read the Carlos Castaneda books about his teacher, Don Juan Matus, many years before. So I had that whole framework, and I had a dream one night that um, I was walking through a a cafe, like a little Mexican cafe, maybe, and there were booths, and I looked into one of the booths, and I saw a man who appeared to be a Nagual, a a teacher in that tradition, talking to a younger man. And I, I remember in the dream I said, oh, there's the teacher I want. And then I thought, no, they're speaking Spanish. I could never understand them. And so, because my Spanish at that time wasn't that good. And so I walked out the back door of the restaurant, closed the door, and then I realized, no, wait, they were speaking English. And I couldn't get back in the door. I turned around and tried to get back in. I couldn't get back in. So I said to myself in that moment, I said, I'll never let that happen again. And a few weeks later, somebody told me about this Mexican Nagual, a man of power that was starting to teach in Northern California just a couple hours from where I lived. And so I said, I'm there, you know. Right. So we drove over there and 
and there he was, and he was as advertised, and I started, he was teaching there every month, and so I was driving, and then he started doing journeys to pyramids, and and Egypt, and Teotihuacan, and Mexico, and the Yucatan, and the Mayan pyramids, and, and Honduras, and Guatemala, and we just went all over. I just, <clears throat> at the time, all I could do was kind of hold out a credit card and say, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> so when you and, said uh, you'll never let that happen again, what do you mean by that when the door closed and you weren't able to get back in? Do you consider that an opportunity, or can you give us what you mean by that? Yeah, thanks. I think it meant for me in that moment, I will never um, let an opportunity like that pass by without exploring it. I won't let my mind talk me out of it for some reason that I don't, that, that, that I'm going to stop and question those little things like, well, they're not speaking English or whatever. Right. Um, and reasons why I can't have the teacher that I want or, and it applies to everything in life. And I confess that I'm still working on that particular thing to, to say yes to the universe at every moment, you know, and, and yes to the opportunities, yes to the abundance, yes to the possibilities that life offers and, and not say, well, you know, I'll come back and check that out later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you feel the difference between, because um, you were saying you have been a spiritual seeker and you've had a lot of other teachings, but what it sounded like that you weren't being fulfilled with what something that you were looking for. And when you came upon him, there was this fulfillment. Is that correct in saying? Or uh-huh. Can you give us a distinction between the difference of what you were learning and what, what this made the difference for you? It sounds like he, yeah. when you came upon him, it was something, you know, obviously at the, you know, it was meant for it to be. Uh-huh. I think there were a couple things. Well, first of all, he was a Mexican man, and I, as I said, I had a great love of Mexico mm-hmm. and, I, and the culture and, and that understanding, and I, I had never really connected with the kind of teachings that have come to us from the East. The other, the other thing was he was the real deal. I could see that he absolutely was authentic, that he walked his talk, and that he wasn't just there to teach us something that he thought, but to tell us about something that he knew. The other thing was that, you know, many, many spiritual traditions that I had been exposed to, or at least the way I had interpreted them or the teachers had interpreted them to me, those spiritual traditions invited me to deny my emotions, to deny my passions, to, to move away from my lust or whatever, whatever was not acceptable or good, you know, in me, I, I was supposed to transcend. And when I met Miguel, I realized immediately that he was a man who lived fully present as a human being. If he was lustful, he was lustful because that was who he was in the moment. Right. And if he read, and then, but he also had a full recognition of his himself as spirit, as consciousness. Wow. But he wasn't afraid to live life passionately and fully as a human. And that was something that I didn't realize that I was missing until he showed me that it was possible to do both. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, interesting. Well, with that, why don't we lead into the five agreements and the new relationship? Um, I know there's so much to talk about on this on this uh, subject and to expand. So, however you want to lead into that, you've got the floor. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, again, it's Again, it's the same kind of a story in a way where I I woke up one morning before dawn and wrote down some things beside the bed and went back to sleep. And when I woke up in the morning, I looked at these things. I said, wow, that's pretty interesting stuff. I wonder what it is. And I, and, and I thought, you know, I could probably um, improve on this. Or, you know, I started adding things. There were five things. And I started adding things. And then I had six or seven. And... And then I took them out. and But everything I did, everything I could think of to do, I ended up with the same five in the same order. So when I would sit down and look at them again, I'd take out whatever I added or change the order, and it turned out to be what it, where I'd started. So I wow. said, you know, these were, not, these were not given to me to mess with. Right. 
and I started teaching them. I did a series of teleclasses on them and and um, started teaching them to groups. And and last year I I did a um, a series of six evenings at a singles group where I live in Northern California in Santa Rosa, and, mm-hmm. and uh, we recorded them. I did one on each of these five things, is what I'm calling agreements now, and and. Uh, Recorded them, and so we have an audio series now of the five agreements, each one from one of those evenings. And it's, it, it's as I've taught it more and I've lived it more, it's become a very powerful teaching. And we just did a Valentine's Week workshop here. I had a group of people that came down here to Chicago, and, right. and uh, we did Valentine's in Paradise there. And, and we looked at one, we did five days, and we looked at one of these on each day, and and on the one hand, it's very, very powerful, and on the other hand, I see that it's it's beyond where a lot of people are. It's a very spiritual approach to relationship, and and so I, I'm working with somebody to help me back up a little bit and, and lay foundations that people can really grasp that more meets the needs where they are until they can work their way up to this. But we'll talk about the five today, and right. and right. appreciate that you have a special. Uh, demographic of people listening to us that uh, we're already wide open for this kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the joy of having a radio show through the Internet. You can tap into the world, you know, and um, people from all over. And also, you know, that that the show is about, that people can call in and connect with the guest um, of what they have to share and their own experience with their own journey and... um, you know, it's about uh, people awakening. And I think this is a perfect example of awakening and what you talk about is love. And, um, you know, it's interesting because for myself, I recognize that what I grew up with about love in my family what is, is nothing of what I feel love is today. So I think that for me that was a huge insight. So, I mean, you know, again, I just think talking about this and, in relationship, and I'm sure this expands not only in your partnership with your uh, husband, but also in a part. It doesn't matter, correct? In any relationship. Yeah, these things, <clears throat> these five agreements that uh, were gifted to me really are ultimately about our relationship with ourselves. And I talk a lot about them in the context of a romantic relationship because that's where so many people are confused now. Right. As you, right. As you mentioned. The, the old model that's served for pretty much forever uh, has been a, a more of a survival model until a couple of generations ago where people needed to partner, they needed to have children. Somebody just said to me yesterday that they they felt like they were, the only reason their parents had kids on the farm was so they could be slaves on the farm. And when she was 15, she said, that's not my life, and she left. And but right up until that time, you know, that, that idea of survival mm-hmm. has been a predominant reason for that kind of relationship. And the idea of romance is even very recent in the history of humans, you know, this idea of romantic love. And it's always been practical love. Right. And so we're, but now we don't need survival. Men and women don't need each other for for survival, for support, for a division of labor. We we can outsource our labor, our baking, and our child care, and our cookie baking, all that kind of stuff. We can outsource that, and it's not surprising that the, I'm going to forget the statistics, but a great number of of child households or single parent households in our country now. It's like we've fragmented from communities to the to the uh, to the nuclear family. And now we've even broken the nuclear family and people are living in, in real isolation. And, and I think yeah, there's many reasons for that. Mm-hmm. Fear being the, the bottom line. Oh, absolutely, which fear is it's like the underlying thing, I think, for everything. It may not look that way, but I think when you boil mm-hmm. it down to nothing, that's exactly what it ends up being is the fear. Yeah. My belief, you know. And um, I think, yeah, mine too. And it it's, would seem to me that people have become more and more afraid of who they are, mm-hmm. more and more afraid of being judged and rejected for who they are. 
And I think one of the reasons we, so many people isolate themselves now is because um, they're, they live in that fear, that fear of, of being found out not to be who they pretend to be and then being rejected for that. Mm-hmm. And it just gets safer and safer to, to live isolated. And it's something I love about being here. I'm in a village of 500 people, and the half of them are related to the other half, and right. and the kids are playing in each other's yards, and and it's it's community. Absolutely. And, I, I, and how and where I live when I'm in Northern California in Santa Rosa is beautiful and wonderful, and I, I have close friends, but and and created a community there of people that are doing this work together, but but it's a very different thing than that relaxed natural kind of relationship and community here. Mm -hmm. See people just sitting out on their porch for hours at a time just talking. Just talking. They're not talking about spiritual things. They're not talking about how they can be better people in the world, be more loving, more caring, better parents. They're just chatting about whatever it comes up to chat about. Mm -hmm. Very different. So, yeah, so we've We've hit on the first agreement right there that that in the old dream, as we say in the Toltec world, we were all dreaming, and, and we all entered a dream. We were born into a family that was dreaming, and that family was dreaming how they should be as parents, good, bad, right, and wrong, and they were dreaming how their children should be, to both be good children and to reflect on them as good parents. And that included uh, religion and uh, and the social skills and uh, the dress and everything that they knew was right, politics, everything. Mm -hmm. As soon as they could hook our attention, they downloaded that information, that dream they were dreaming, into our minds so we would dream the same dream that they were dreaming. Mm -hmm. And we call that, in our tradition, we call that domestication. They domesticated us, and they couldn't do that unless they had some kind of power over us. And the power that they had, that they, that we gave them to have over us, was our fear of being rejected by them, of not being loved, of not getting their approval, and not getting their attention. And ultimately. If they ultimately withdrew their attention and love from us, we somehow knew, even though we didn't have language for it even, we knew somehow that we would cease to exist. We would die, we'd be annihilated, exterminated. Um, If we came home, if we, at two years old, stood up for ourselves and fought and fought and fought for our right to stay up and finish the program or our right not to eat the broccoli, and if we demanded our dream and and fought for our dream long and hard enough, we knew that ultimately they could change the locks on the doors. That they would, first they would send us to our room until we came to our senses. They would force us to do what they wanted us to do. But the, the overall message was we have the power to do the ultimate rejection, which will lead to your annihilation. And that created tremendous fear in us and so out of that fear, then, we agreed to go along with their dream. Do you recognize that process? Yeah, I do. I, the question that I get is, um, you know, when this is all happening, of course, you're young. So, mm-hmm. uh, and in having children that, I've raised, that I'm raising myself, um, two are still at home, you know, it's, so when you... You know, when you send them to their room and when you want them, because I can totally see where you're putting your dreams into them. I can totally understand that. But at the same time, if they're not aware of what they're doing based upon what their their parents, you know, did for them, or um, how do you, as such a young child, how do you fend for yourself and not go, you know, how do you do do that as a young child? Great question. Yeah, how old are your kids? Uh, 26, 18, and 14. Oh, yeah. So you, I always want to have a little caveat here that says we're not making parents wrong, especially after they've finished the job here. Yeah. Well, my job's still not <laughs> finished. 
we still yeah. have you know we still have some time to go, but yeah, I don't think it's yeah. ever going to, even if they're gone, you know. You know, most of it happens in the first five years of our lives, mm. and and there's a good answer to your question, and and it it has to do with this dream thing that parents are dreaming a dream. And the child, when, when we start to mature and our nervous system matures, we start kind of seeing the world and feeling what we want, what we like, what we don't like. Right. We are creating our own dream, and it's always going to be different than our parents. Mm-hmm. But when parents are unaware of the, that they're dreaming and that the dream that they're dreaming is totally arbitrary, totally arbitrary, mm-hmm. because it has to do with their parents' dream mm-hmm. and their culture's dream or where they live. And, and that all just has to do with where they popped up in the world and what was downloaded into them. Mm-hmm. You know, like the example of if you had popped up in a fundamentalist Taliban family in Afghanistan as a woman, mm-hmm. your dream of what it means to be a woman or what it means to be a mother and what you should, how you should domesticate your children and how they should dream, especially your little girls, would be totally different than the dream that you have and how you raised your kids now. Right. Totally. And, or if, you, if you'd have popped up into some like big drug cartel family in Colombia mm-hmm. or east side of Chicago or, or a middle class family in the suburbs of L.A. or you know, wherever it was, it's a, I don't know who controls this. I don't believe there's anybody controlling it. We as life appear somewhere, and we pop up in the middle of somebody else's dream. Mm, interesting. And they're dreaming. Mm-hmm. And they think that their dream is the truth. They think that they're dreaming reality. And one of the greatest gifts of this Toltec path and one of the greatest gifts that Miguel Ruiz gave me is to really show me that the way I'm dreaming is a universe which is totally unique that lives inside of my head. Can you um, expand on, because there's a couple things you've been mentioning in which I think to get maybe a better understanding. The, uh, you're a Toltec master, and I'm not sure what that really is, do you know what I mean, and what you do as a Toltec master, because you also mentioned the Toltec world and that about these dreams. Can you kind of expand on that and just give us what that means by being a Toltec master? Because is, is that what uh, um, Miguel had trained you? Yes. Okay. Because I don't really, I've never, you know, well, I shouldn't say I've never heard of that, but I've heard of it, but I don't really know what that is. Okay, yeah, let's back up a little bit. Yeah, if you don't mind, um, that'd be great. No, I don't care. It was great. The word Toltec was given to a culture which built pyramids in Mexico, central Mexico, north of what Mexico City is now, and came and went and left behind their pyramids when the Aztecs settled in Mexico City and created a huge complex of pyramids there and a city that then the Spaniards came and destroyed and built Mexico City on top of. These people went and found abandoned pyramids an hour's drive away from Mexico City to the north, and said and found beautiful masks and carvings and jade and, and obsidian artwork and these incredible pyramids, which are is nearly the biggest pyramids in the world, mm-hmm. and which is now a beloved national park and um, and visited by many many Mexican people and is a very powerful spiritual center. And I take groups there often to do. <clears throat> the the work of reclaiming the truth of who we are in the pyramid complex for a week at a time. So, so and in the, in the Nahuatl language of the Aztecs, the word Toltec means artist. And because of who they were, they weren't Toltecs weren't really a race or a. Uh, they were more of a society of artists and and um, farmers and seekers who came together for unknown reasons and created this city. And they say there were possibly as many as 200,000 people. It was the biggest city of its kind at its time 2,000 years ago. Wow. And, and then they vanished. 
and people even came from very far away in Mexico to to live there. They found like pottery remnants and things and little side communities around where the city was that that were clearly brought by people that lived as far south as Oaxaca and southern Mexico and places in Yucatan. So it was a tremendous center of trade and, and spirituality. So we expand on that a little bit and we call the Toltec, we say it means artist of the spirit because most clearly these were people who were there to explore spiritually. The Aztecs and the Mayans, you know, you hear all these stories about and see movies and cutting out people's hearts and, and slaves and sacrifices and brutal war. None of that is evident with the Toltecs. Um, a, a few what appear to be sacrifices buried in pyramids and the pyramids that were expanded maybe, but not the kind of what we view with it from our dream as brutal kinds of, uh, of sacrifice and war that that we see in other cultures later. Mm-hmm. So that's that's where Toltec came from. There's really very little known about them, but the spiritual teachings and the building styles actually too moved out into Mexico and became an important part of Mexico. Chichen Itza, even the Mayans adopted a lot of the of the, of the spiritual practices and and the architecture. Yeah, you have to the explain teaching. That. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, it's your turn. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say. Well, you had mentioned that you take people there to cre- to reclaim who they are. Um, how is that that by taking them that they can reclaim who they are? Is it just be- is it because of the um, the energy, or do you know what I'm saying? Um, how is it that what one would reclaim who they are? It's a guided it's a guided experience okay. that starts physically in a place that we call hell, which is part of the complex in the pyramids, which is the hell of judgment and fear that we live in, most of us, most of our lives. Mm-hmm. And at that point we surrender to Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent, and and do ceremonies and and teaching each day as we move through down what they call the Avenue of the Dead which is the body of Quetzalcoatl, and digest away those fears, digest away our attachments to our physical world. We surrender to the angel of death. There's beautiful rituals and, and teaching and challenges along the way until we, we emerge uh, at the other head of the snake, at the base of the pyramid of the moon, completely digested, completely freed of all those illusions of who we're not, Right. which opens us to who we are, which is beings of spirit and love. Um, you mentioned the, the book of mine. It was recent, recently published called The Everything Toltec Wisdom Book. Right. And the last chapter is uh, called A Spiritual Journey Through Teotihuacan. Um, oh, okay. So right. I re- refer you, the people listening to us, to uh, take a look at that. And I'll give a really, it's a, kind of a blow-by-blow account of how that journey works. Interesting. That sounds interesting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, oh, it's I, fascinating. Well, because you know, and just in um, from my own experience, what I just got recently is, you know, and we we tapped on this earlier in the show, is that you can do all these different teachings and different meditations and different whatever workshops and so forth, but to have the fulfillment of actually seeing your life really change, your behavior, your whole life change, that the outer world doesn't affect. You who you are, you know who affect you who you are or affect you at all. Yes. I think is fascinating. And um, no, we... it would seem to me that a lot of people that are listening or you know um, out there really to ha- to have that awakening and go, you know, what I mean, because I, I know you've talked to a, I've talked to a lot of people who've been on a spiritual journey for 25, 35 years, myself included, you know what I mean? Doing all the work, and I think it's been great information. It's, you know, it's helped me, you know, in a lot of different ways. But I think when you get to the whole core of it, what we're talking about is the love, you know, um, for yourself and for everything and seeing that is completely different. I couldn't agree more. I do agree completely. 
Yeah. And I'll tell you what I've seen that happens. When we go to psychology, to therapy, to spiritual practice, to even to the gym, whatever we do, if we do it so that we can improve ourselves, what we're saying is we're not okay the way we are. Right. And when we're saying we're not okay the way we are, we are not loving ourselves. Mm. We're rejecting ourselves. And we're back to the same standard that's been held up to us since we were tiny and all through our lives, both inside our mind and from the outside, that we have to be better than we are in order to get the fulfillment, the love, the money, the relationship, the sex, the recognition that we need to be happy, to feel fulfilled. And there's always more. And no matter how much we do, no matter how perfect we get, the judge inside of us raises the standard and we have to do better. Right. The judge inside of us never says, you're perfect, you're great the way you are, good job, I'm going to get off your back now. Mm. The judge says, you've been to the gym three times this week, but you haven't lost any weight, I can't believe it. You come home and pig out, what's the matter with you? Right. Even though we went to the gym three times a week because the judge was telling us we should, because nobody's going to love us if we gain a couple pounds, then the judge makes us wrong for something we do or we don't stay long enough or, or we're too vain worrying about our body. You know, it's like just around and around and around. And so all these things that we've been struggling to do so that we can be good enough to get the love that we, that unconditional love that we missed when we were little, are all based on conditions from ourselves right. and we're not loving ourselves we're not accepting ourselves we're demanding that we improve and be more perfect before we will give ourselves self-love and that's why it hasn't worked that's why people do it for 25 years right. therapy, spiritual work whatever it is mm-hmm. and never feel satisfied never feel whole never feel like they got what they were looking for yeah, I can say that that's true for me absolutely I feel like I you know to get to get better to be a better person or to you know what I mean and I can a totally better I can... better mother a better wife a better husband a better child of aging parents and, yep. you know less wrinkles more less body odor a nicer clothes a better car all of it so people will respect us people will like us people will not reject us but in the meantime, we're rejecting ourselves in order to try to motivate ourselves, supposedly, to do those things so that other people will accept us. It's the strangest thing when you stop and really take it apart and look at it. No, it absolutely is, because I can, I can see that in, in, I mean, if you can, well, I don't want to say, if, the, if children knew this, at, at a, you know what I mean? If this was, I guess, like if you were in that space, that it would just, your children would be the same way. Do you know what I mean? If, yeah. if You know what I mean? I'm saying if parents were already in that place of being that, you know, in the beingness of it and being the love and not worrying about everything else and having all these fears in the children naturally, but such is the case, it's not that, you know, it's not that way. I mean, you can see mm. where the kids are, you know, it's, I guess, you know, my grade's not good enough that I need to work harder you know what I mean? When they're doing the best they can, mm-hmm. anyway. I mean, there's so many, so many avenues we can touch. This could be a whole other conversation. You yeah. Know? Oh yeah, the parenting conversation is huge. Well, I think in just in general in children. I mean, I think how they're growing up, and you know, and um, just of what we they're expect. You know, just everything with the kids and how they're looking at. You know, how can I be the best? You know. It's looking in all the wrong places, I guess, is what I'm really saying. They're looking they all even the need external. the best cell phone now. Huh? They even need the best cell phone now. Yeah, well, I mean, it's looking at all the external and the outside instead of really going to what really matters within. It's no mystery that teen suicide statistics are what they are. Right. Because it's just torturous to grow up being so insecure about who we are and so depending on other people to validate us and make us okay, at the same time that everybody is putting each other down in order to be on top, oh, it's just brutal. And so, it gets more subtle as we get older. Mm-hmm. 
So does this all go back to, because I know we're going to talk about the agreement, you know, we were talking about love and how um, there's this expectation, you know, from other people. Do you, would you say that it really boils down to self-love first? It does. And the the other magic that I recognized when I met Miguel Ruiz was that he wasn't telling us how we had to be in order to be good Toltecs or good uh, good anything, good people, good no, there were no standards. There were no rules about how we had to be or should be in order to receive his love or his approval or or each other's. It was simply to show up and accept ourselves. That was the whole message. And then he said, here's a lot of tools that you can use to clear the lies, to clear the garbage, to, to clean up the parts of your mind that reject you so that you can go back to your nature, back to the truth of who you really are, which is an artist of the spirit, which is, uh, which is love, which is acceptance of yourself and all of creation. And so we call it, I call it a, a, a path with no rules and lots of good tools. Oh, wow, I love that, yeah. That's very well said. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's um, very meaningful, you know, to show up and accept yourself. I feel a lot of people are, you know, well, this is good, you know, this is and this is what it's all about. So, um, yeah, very interesting. So and people talk know? a lot about stuff. Huh? Oh, I was, I'm sorry. I was going to say that people talk a lot about self-love at the very same time that they're judging themselves. Self-love is means accepting not the good things about us, but accepting everything about us. Mm. Perfect the way we are and perfect the way we are not. It means that if we have jealousy or rage or lust or hurt or joy or excitement, they're all perfect, they're all us, and in the acceptance of everything that we are, it's acceptance of the body we have, of the everything about us, the acceptance of that is what love is, self-love. If, and I've asked people, what, how do you demonstrate self-love? Do you, you know, they say, oh, I take a bubble bath with candles every, oh gosh, I haven't done it for a couple of years now. And, and that seems to be what self-love is. Mm-hmm. Now that's a nice thing to do. But very often people are needing to relax in the hot bath with candles to relieve the stress of trying to get it right all day for themselves and the rest of the world. And it's not really self-acceptance at all. Right, so they don't really get to the core of it, which is, like you said, accepting the self. It's it's one thing to treat yourself to massages or whatever, the bubble bath. But that's just almost like a temporary, it sounds like to me. It's yeah. a temporary fix. But when you there's get out of the bathtub, there's still this not accepting. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's starting with... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I keep interrupting you. you no, you're right no, ahead. not at all. No, not at all. Please. No, no. It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> There's no turn on this radio show. It just it just flows. Um, I, I think self-love, I mean, that's been a conversation in a lot of my radio shows because we've brought it up about self-love, and everybody has their um, their own meaning to that. But it, I, it, I guess I, for me, it's never really, and I don't know if anybody else is out listening out there, but for me, it's never really resonated to where it's like, oh, I get it. Do you know what I mean? It's like I still keep questioning, what is self-love? Because I, you know what I mean? And I can see what you're saying, because I think that's true for a lot of people, that it's accepting us, even this part of me that I, you know, that I don't like. Do you know what I mean? And I do. that's almost like a relief. Yes. Because that's self-love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I think that kind of opens up the door, you know, like really big for people to really get when that. We go, when we go to therapy and we say, gosh, you know, I don't love myself. Well, here, here's an example. I was in the pyramids. I was in the pyramids with a group. And we were on, probably on the second or third day of the trip and we are walking through the pyramids ready for another one of our exercises. And this fellow caught up and said, you know, he said, I just am not getting it. 
I am, I'm not getting it. I said, not getting what? And he said, I'm not loving myself the way I'm supposed to. You keep talking about self-love and everybody seems blissed out somehow. And he said, I just, I'm not getting it. I'm not loving myself. And I said, well, okay, you know, I can accept that. That's fine with me. I said, can you accept that you're not loving yourself? And he said, no, because I'm supposed to. I and mean, that's why I'm here. I flew over here from Europe. I, I've spent a lot of money, and I don't want to leave here until I really love myself. And it's not working. And I'm, 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 I've got to figure out what to do. And I said, well, for right now, could you just accept that you're not loving yourself the way you should? And he kept saying, no, but I'm supposed to. I, said, I know you're supposed to, but can you accept that right now you're not, and can you accept that you're supposed to? Because that's the reality. I just said, that's just the reality right now. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm just asking you to say, oh, here's what's real in this moment. And I'm asking you if you can accept what's real in this moment. And he said, well, yeah, I can, I can accept that. Mm-hmm. And, and then I sprung my punchline on him. I said, that's self-love. Did and his whole it? body softened, and he grinned, <laughs> and he said, oh, I get it. It's not something I have to do to get somewhere to do that. I don't have to get anything to do it or achieve anything or perfect anything. The only thing I need to feel that experience is to accept what's true in this moment about me just the way it is. Mm-hmm. So if we go to therapy and we tell our therapist, God, I don't love myself. He says, well, this is a problem. We've got to fix it. The therapist has colluded with our judge that we're not good enough because we don't love ourselves enough. Mm -hmm. Or we drink. Or we womanize. Or we isolate ourselves. Or we overeat. Or, you know, whatever it is we take to therapy. The minute the therapist says, oh, this is a problem and we can fix it, he's agreeing with our judge that we're not good enough the way we are or a spiritual teacher, or a spiritual path, or anything that we reach out for, to try to find that fulfillment, if it agrees with us that we're not good enough the way we are, it's part of the problem and not the solution. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if people that are listening, including myself, if we get nothing more out of this conversation than that, we're there that we are perfect the way we are. There's no standard that lives outside of us in this universe. There's no God. There's no Santa Claus. And you notice how similar they are with their lists and good and bad and who's naughty and nice. Punishment and reward. I don't have any evidence that that's happening anywhere outside of my own mind. And if I can stop it from happening in my mind by realizing it's a lie, I'm free. And Toltec Path is a path to personal freedom. And the personal freedom is the freedom from the fear that we're not worthy of being loved the way we are and we have to constantly find ways to improve ourselves to get it right, to be better, so that we'll finally be worthy of love. And we can stop that whole cycle and break that dream the minute we say, in every moment that we say, in this moment, I'm okay the way I am. And then in the next moment, if you forget and you're judging yourself and you you listen and say, oh, I'm judging myself, you accept that. Mm-hmm. You don't judge yourself for judging yourself. Mm-hmm. You don't well, reject yourself. For, Go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You simply say, ah, and look at that darling, percep- darling perfection that I am judging myself for judging myself for judging myself. Isn't that adorable? I love it. I believe that's an awareness that people have to um, come into, don't you feel? That's awareness. Yeah. That people, I mean, yeah. it's really, would you say it's really being in the moment in order to have that awareness? Because, you know, um, I'll say for myself that, you know, I, I recognize all that, and but when the time when it happens, I don't, I'm not in the moment of awareness of that, you know what I mean, until after the fact. Right. But maybe some people are not in that place that they can 
you know, immediately go to, I, you know, okay, I'm allowed, and, you know, this is what self-love is, is accepting this judgment that I'm having on myself, and it's okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, yes. that's where I think it'd be great to, if we can bring everybody on board, so to speak. And, you know, we were talking about the idea of dreaming and how we dream our reality, and, and which is, to me, the foundation and the most beautiful part of the, the Toltec teaching. Very low-flying plane. Can you hear it? Yeah, a little, just faintly, uh, but I can tell it's a plane oh. plane, yeah. Very oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the Toltec tradition, the idea of dreaming is that we're not seeing what's out there in reality. Because, as you, we saw in high school, the light reflects off of what's out there, and the light brings an image of that to our eyes, and our eyes translate that light image into neurological impulses which travel through nerves and the brain, and somewhere it makes a little picture of what the light brought us in our mind. Mm -hmm. So we can't see what's out there. We're not looking at what's out there. We're looking at the light as it's been translated neurologically, neurally, in our mind. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, the Toltecs take it another step farther and say that, yes, the light is the perfect messenger. When the light leaves the tree, bounces off the tree outside my window and comes to my eye, it's, it's, it's bringing me the perfect message of what that is there. <clears throat> but then in my mind, and it's a, it's a message carried by the light, but in my mind, in my channels of perception, we call it, I have stored light from the past. I have memories. I studied botany and, and biology in college as part of my my college education, so I know if it's a Sudha Sugha Menzizi eye mm -hmm. or an Arbutus Tendistili eye, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's stored light. And the more of that stored light gets picked up by the, by the light of the tree coming through my channels of perception, the more I distort what's actually out there. Mm -hmm. I change the message that the light brought to me. The light's a perfect messenger. But when it goes through my channels of perception, it picks up the stored light related to that message, distorts it, and then creates that little virtual reality, that little image of what we call the dream in my mind. And that's what I look at. And the mistake I make is thinking that that's what's out there. So can then can you... So then what I hear you saying is you would almost have to... Um, all the words that I'm getting is like get rid of that distorted, you know what I mean? And have the direct, Bingo. yeah. So how does one get rid of the distorted, all the stuff that's stored in there? Because what it sounds like it's doing is coming through and it's picking up all that other stuff, which translates it, well, it takes the message from where it began to something completely different because it has to go through all this other garbage like stuff. You're understanding it perfectly. And yeah, so then how do you get rid of all that stuff? And with trees, it's easy, but if it's like I had a woman that said, every time I see a man with a big mustache, I just get, I shake, you know, I don't know what it is, I can't talk to him, they ask me out, I, I, I stumble, I can't even talk, and so we just started, she closed her eyes and she started going back in time, and, and there was her father when she was a little child, angry and yelling at her, and he had a big mustache, wow. and that image was part of the stored light in her mind. So when the light brought big mustache to her eyes, he went through the channels of perception, picked up not just the image of her father, but the emotional memory of the father. Right. And that's then, when she looked at the image in her own mind of what the light brought her from outside, it caused fear because it included the emotional memory of the fear of her father. So the answer to your question is, first of all, we know we, we come to understand that we're dreaming. Right. Then we stop believing anything that we dream. We stop believing that it's out there. We stop believing that men with big mustaches can't be trusted or they're angry or they're going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And we start saying, how am I distorting in my dreaming mind, in my channels of perception? 
And when I said that the Toltec path was a path of no rules but lots of good tools, the tools are very specifically directed towards clearing, finding, identifying, and clearing the old stored light out of those channels of perception so that, as you said, the light can come through more and more clearly without that distortion, and we can see more and more clearly or dream more and more clearly what's out there because we're still going to be dreaming it. Right. And when you realize that every human has different stored light, Mm -hmm. different emotional memories, Mm -hmm. we realize that every human distorts creation into a very personal dream that's absolutely unique to them. And real. And very real. And no two people live in the same universe. Absolutely, yeah. Interesting. So, so when when planes fly into the Twin Towers at 9-11 and America is in shock and grief and horror, right. we look at the paper and we see pictures of people dancing in the streets and shooting guns in the air. And we say, hey, they're barbarians, how could this be? Right. And the only difference is because they had a different dream about that event. They had different distorting light. Their domestication told them that we were bad guys. And our domestication said they're bad guys. Palestinians and Israelis living across the street from each other, born into a family, domesticated into the dream of the family, learned to hate each other. When I couldn't possibly tell them apart if I met them. Right. And they will die. They will put dynamite around themselves and blow themselves up to kill each other only because of how they've been taught to dream by somebody else. That is the only reason. And they, and they believe their dream. Could you say All conflict. That would, would you say that the, the dream that they're being taught, could, would you say that is also maybe interpreted as their belief? Like, you know what I mean? Because they've taken on a belief from their parents or whomever. Do you know what I mean? That it's their belief right. that they die for God or whatever their belief is. Would you say that's the same thing as the dream? The dream is a description of the beliefs and the agreements that we've made throughout our lives, mostly when we were little. Yes, that's what the dream is. Okay, okay. It's it's the totality of all of those. And, you know, I was raised in a Republican family, so when I started voting, I voted Republican. Absolutely, Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. And then I started reprogramming my own dream and changing the dream. And, and, and with the tools of the Toltecs, I started taking apart every part of my dream and questioning it and looking through all the channels. We've, we've become the, uh, what we call the jaguar, stalking in the jungle of our own minds. And the prey is the beliefs and the agreements and the dream that create fear and judgment and isolation and separation. Mm-hmm. And we stalk those and we find them and we grab them by the back of the neck and we shake them and we throw them out and then we put the truth where that lie was. Mm-hmm. Wow. And the more truth we have in the channels of perception, the more clearly the truth will come through and not be distorted from what's out there. Mm-hmm. And so what we're doing is reprogramming the mind that was programmed. We're re-domesticating ourselves. The third level of that work is what we call the eagle, and and the eagle's work is to then let go of all even the good beliefs and all the new agreements and all the reprogramming and recognize that there's only one thing here and just to become that one thing without taking it apart as good, bad, right, wrong, or good, 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 depending on how we're doing it. And for most people... It's enough to have the the awareness that we're dreaming and then set out to transform the dream into something that makes them happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which was another thing that I loved about this path. There were no lofty standards. There was no achievement in terms of the favor of God or or my karma even or my Akashic records or, or fixing anything in the past. All that was offered to me was a chance to be happy all the time. And that was something that I could measure because I was either in love, in happy, 
or I was in fear. I was in fear and judgment and rejection, or I was experiencing love and acceptance and happy. And I could monitor that any moment. And the moment I went from happy or love to fear and unhappy suffering, I knew that I had believed one of the stored stories in my mind that was a lie. Because there's nothing about the universe that is unhappy. Mm-hmm. There's nothing about the universe that has jealousy, anger, rage, any of that that I create, that I imagine is in the universe, I create with my own mind. Mm-hmm. So and when it's there, your turn. Oh, well, if you want to, you can finish that, please. <laughs> no, go ahead. Well, please. I was going to say, so, so what you're saying is, what I hear you saying is that to go back and clean up the karma, it's not necessary to do that, or you don't have to do that. Or there's no point. Well, in really, it's really part of another belief system, isn't it? Pardon me? It's really part of another belief system, isn't it? Pardon? Sure. That we have to go and clean up or our karma. Right. That we have to go back and this is a Akashic Records or whatever. Or, you know, um, right. that, that's my question. So it would be like going in back into the Akashic Records and finding out where that stems from that keep preventing you from moving forward getting to the core, and by getting to the core, going back into the Kashic Records to find out where that originated from. That's, well, I'm that's, saying that's that, a belief. Right. The, yeah, okay, mm-hmm. yeah, I see what you're saying. But that's one, of the, that's one of the new stories that we picked up along the way somewhere. Right. We rejected the religion of our parents, but then we needed some kind of story, and so a lot of us adopted stories about karma and Akashic Records and seven levels of heavenly ascension, and, and uh, oh, there's all kinds of things out right. there to believe, if you believe them. And the only, my only question for them is, do they make me happy to believe them? Mm-hmm. Do they make are you they happy based to in, them? Yeah. Yeah. Are they based in love or fear? Do they create in me love or fear? And so it really came down to each moment in my life, in my happy in this moment. And if I'm not happy, and I don't mean la la, oh, isn't life wonderful, happy, which is usually the strategy that denies our fear and pain. Right. But the kind of happiness that is our nature, we came into the world, we came into this world happy. We had no stories that made us suffer. We had no fear, no guilt, no anger, no jealousy. We came into this world just pure spirit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's been our nature ever since. And then we were told a lot of lies that separated us from that nature. Mm-hmm. And if we can clear those lies out of our mind, we can open ourselves to go back to the truth of who we are. And that's what I meant about it's a path that takes us back to our truth. Right. Right. There are no goals of achieving anything. There's only stripping away illusions that separate us from the truth of who we are as love, as spirit, as it's the divine presence that animates everything. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, which takes us back. Or, great. Yeah, which takes we, us back. Go ahead to the new to the agreements. Yeah, to, well, the domestication. We're talking about domestication. Yes, we we, I, in, we've got about thirty-two minutes left, so I want to be sure that we. I want to tap on the agreements. I mean, you know, I want oh. to talk about those. So, I feel those are important. Um, okay. Also, um, I mean, yeah. Thirty-two minutes. Yes. Okay. I think I put it in for Ooh. ninety, and it should have been one hundred and twenty. I'm not sure what what I did there, but. Yeah, yeah. we talked about one twenty. Well, I know we did talk about one twenty, and then I this morning I was like, oh my gosh, it's an hour and a half. It's only ninety minutes, and uh, so. Okay, so we've got. Yeah, about so we have half an hour. Yes, about okay. half an hour. And if we can't, we can always tap in, you know, another show and bring in. We can always do it again, bring it in again. Be my pleasure. I think it's 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 a it's a great conversation and it's it needs to be said. So I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to let you. And then if I have questions, I'll ask in between. Okay. Well, you're. I mean, I love your your reflection because you both show me where I'm not clear and encourage me when you say yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, it's not, yeah, I mean, I think just the clarity, just because I'm trying to get clarity and clear, you know, get, getting clarity for myself and for anybody who's listening out there on, when I'm asking the questions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I'm a question person. Yep. That's probably why I have the radio show. No, probably, but as yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, so this is perfect. They're, they're great questions. Thank you. So, you're welcome. Thank you. So we were domesticated. Let's go back to the fact that we came into this world, ta-da, you know, just alive and, and with no shame about our bodies. We could be laying there naked, you know, and changing our diaper and strangers could walk in the room. We didn't care. We didn't say, hey, cover me up, you know. We just, we didn't, all of that was taught to us. All of that was part of our domestication. And everybody was domesticated differently, so we all have different dreams about it. Um... And then how we can be naked in our bodies, you know, where. I was just we were kidding around with somebody the other day about down here at the beach, you know, there's people where I'm staying, living, that people in bikinis on the beach. But if they walked through the beach restaurant onto the little dirt road where the little shops are selling seashell trinkets in their bikini, that's a little off, you know. That's not, that's not quite as acceptable as having the bikini 100 feet away on the beach. And then if they walked up through town, up the hill to the house, that would not be right at all. And if they drove into town and went to the store or even over the hill in a bikini, that would be really off base. And if they went to the big shopping mall in a bikini, you know, it's so, the domestication is so finely tuned. And, but it depends on where you live and who, what culture and what family and what religion or non-religion, all of that creates this domestication. So we arrived with none of that. In fact, my mythology is that there is a God who loves us unconditionally and really wanted to share that and have us know what it felt like to be loved unconditionally. But God couldn't just give us all a big hug. So God needed a channel for that unconditional love to come through into this world. And he gave us infants. And you know how everybody wants to pick up a little baby and look it in the eye? Mm-hmm. Because we know that that little infant is not judging us. Mm-hmm. And we try to make eye contact, that, eye contact with that little baby, and we hold it up or we bend over its little crib or whatever. And, we, and if it looks away, we try to get the tension back. You know, blah, 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 make noise. Mm-hmm. Try to get the baby's attention back because we are downloading this unconditional love. And we're so hungry for it. And it brings us to that place, and we're feeding unconditional love back to this little baby. And we fall into love together in that space with an infant. The channel for that unconditional love coming from the other side through to us here. But how do you you domesticate a being who has no fear? How do you say, if you don't do this the way we want you to do it, you're going to be punished? Punishment? What's punishment? I can't be punished. I'm love. I'm the divine channel here. Want some? Want some divine love? Come over here. I'll give you some. You can't, you can't, you can't form a child to be the perfect child for your family to make you proud if you can't form the child, form the dream. So we have to create, create fear in the child. And the way we create fear in the child is saying, no, 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 no. You have to agree with us of a lie. And the lie is, you're not the source of love. You're not a channel for God's love. We are the source of love. And we will dole love out to you like a commodity based on your performance, your goodness, your rightness, and how you conform with us dreaming how you should be we will dole out this commodity to you based on your performance. And we fight that. Oh, my God, do we fight that. Mm -hmm. The terrible twos Mm -hmm. is all about us fighting to hold on to our dream, our truth, our reality. As well as teenagers. Yes. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that could be another conversation, too, is that you have to hold rules, yes. I mean... The kids have to know, you know, I don't know, that's a, that's a, 
that's very interesting. It's it's eye opening, you know. Because I think you I, asked I, this question. True. You asked this question before, and we went way around. Let's come back around to it in a minute because <laughs> I have an answer for you. And I'm glad you came back to it. So they had to make us afraid of something in order so for us to follow their rules or we wouldn't be interested at all. Mm-hmm. And so what they made us afraid of was not having love, mm. not having acceptance, not having attention, and ultimately not having the, the shelter and the food that sustains us. Mm-hmm. And so we agreed with them under pressure, under duress, like like brainwashing with the bright lights on us, you know, and the bad guys pacing up and down. We finally signed the agreement that says, I'm not the source of love. I'm not a channel for the divine. You are the source of love, and it's a commodity, and I have to bargain for it. I have to be good, and I have to get it right to get that commodity. And the minute minute we did that, and we really gave up, now they could start teaching us what was good, what was bad, what was right, what was wrong, and we would go along because we had to bargain for this commodity of love. And they were the source. And as we got older, our peers became the source, our sisters, brothers, uh, our teachers in school, our religious leader, and and Santa Claus, and ultimately God, became the source of love, watching us to see if we were doing it right and worthy of our share of the commodity. And so that first agreement that we made was the biggest lie we've ever told ourselves. They call it the original sin. We used our word against ourselves, and we had no choice. We told a very big lie to ourselves, and we believed it ever since. And all this talk about self-love and self-acceptance is simply shaking off that agreement, shaking off that lie, and going back to the truth. We are the source of love in our lives. We are the divine. We are this perfect expression of this life force that's here creating all of this universe. Every part of this universe is perfect. There's no part of it that's not perfect here. Every leaf on every tree, every star, every exploding nova, every rainstorm, it's all a a whole, one big whole. And it's all a perfect part of that perfect whole. And there's nothing about any of us that's not also a perfect part of that perfect whole. I mean, how could you be an imperfect part of a perfect whole? Right, when we're all part of the one. So the first thing that I wrote down when I wrote five things down that turned into what I'm calling five agreements that we can change in order to make love come true and experience what I call the new relationship with ourselves, with our lovers, with creation, with our children, is... The old agreement is love is a commodity that lives outside of me and I have to bargain for it to get it. And the new agreement is I am the source of love in my life. And it seems so simple. But if we really get that truth, we're free. Because once you recognize you're the source of love in your life, your dream is perfect, you are perfect, You don't have to get anything right for anybody else. You don't have to perform. You don't have to deny your truth. You don't have to sing and dance. You don't have to manipulate your reality in order to take care of somebody else's feelings. You show up as you. Can you imagine who all of us would have been if we could have been raised knowing that we were that perfect expression of life? That we belonged here, that how we dreamed our dream was the perfect dream for us, mm-hmm. that it wasn't going to be like anybody else's. So there's no point arguing about it, defending it, justifying it, because it was absolutely unique in the whole history of the universe. But we could live it with all of our passion mm-hmm. and let everybody else live their dream with all of their passion. If we did that, there would be no more conflict in the world, between countries, between lovers, between parents and children. There would only be respect for everybody else's dream. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And what better way than to start now, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went yeah, which... I thought they were fabulous. I mean, it was just, it was mm-hmm. like, yes, absolutely. And that brings us back to your question about then how do you do with children because you don't want your little kids to run out in the street and you don't want your teenager out there doing things going to hurt with their life. So, so we domesticate our children. And there's no way around domestication. We're in cultures where, you know, there are belief systems around us all the time. We will end up with a belief system. We'll end up with a dream. But can you... Imagine if you'd have been raised by parents that said, you know, I hear that you don't want to turn off the TV and go to bed right now. And I totally respect your dream of that. It's perfect in your reality, with your needs, with your beliefs, with who you are, what you want right now. Your dream is absolutely perfect and I respect it completely. And... I'm dreaming a different dream, which is a bigger picture. I see that you need to get up and go to school tomorrow. I know that you're not happy when you don't get enough sleep. I get a picture than you can because you only want what you want in the moment. So out of complete respect for your dream, we're going to do mine because I'm bigger. Mm -hmm. You're the difference between that and, God, you make me so angry when you don't do what I say. Now, if you don't get in there right now, here's the results. Here's the consequences. I'm going to turn off the TV for a week and you're not going to get to watch TV because you are bad to resist me. And you're not going to get your share of when when I punish you by sending you to your room or punish you by taking away the TV or punish you by not being nice to you. When I punish you by not giving you my love and acceptance, you're going to be afraid for your existence, and so you're going to do what I want you to do out of fear. And you will learn to install inside of yourself a voice that says, don't make mom mad. Do what she says. Mm -hmm. Pretend to do what she says. Manipulate her into getting what you want. But don't, don't assert your dream because you're bad for wanting it. And that becomes the voice of the inner judge that follows us around day and night trying to regular, regulate our behavior and get us to do it right for other people. Constantly. That's the reason advertising sells billions of dollars of the products is because it says you're not doing it right, smelling right, being right, looking right, acting right, weighing right. And here's a product that can make you better. Mm -hmm. Which then actually leads you into really the new agreement of the the second one. You're not responsible for causing other people's emotions, emotional reactions to your reality. Interesting accident, huh? Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah. yes, so it really, does. It, it, it actually, yeah, yeah. It's because then you feel you're responsible for causing other people's, you know, if your mom, you know, if I get upset because whatever, you know, absolutely. When our mother says to us, you make me so angry when you spill your milk, you make me so angry when you don't come home when you say you're going to come home, uh-huh. I, I, you know, what they're teaching us is that we're directly responsible for their emotional reactions right. and we are rejected if we create in them the wrong emotional reactions. If they're mad, they withdraw their love and approval from us, thereby punishing us and teaching us that we must manage our reality, do what we do in a way that will make them happy so that we can get our commodity. So number two depends on number one. Mm-hmm. Once we agree that it's a commodity, now we learn that we have to manage other people's reality, manipulate our reality in order to get the commodity. Mm -hmm. And this is a tough one for people. People could say, oh, yeah, okay, I'm love, whatever. But um, to really break this agreement, the old agreement being that we are responsible for both creating and fixing 
other people's emotional reactions to us, to our reality. To break that agreement is huge because it's so, we believe it, you know, it's just so ingrained in the, the fabric of our dreams. The wife comes, the husband comes home an hour late for dinner and the wife says, dinner is cold, you said you're going to be at a time, you're not here, I'm so angry, I'm so hurt, why do you do this to me? And he says, oh God, I'm sorry, honey, he either gets mad or he rebels and he storms off or he shuffles and shucks and jives and has an excuse, you know, whatever it is, because he believes that he created her anger. And it seems very real to both people. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not the truth. It's not the truth. If he said he was coming home at 6 and she forgot until 6.30 that he said he wanted a certain thing for dinner and he wanted to, to and she'd agreed to make it, but she spaced it out, <clears throat> she barely got it done by 7, and he walks in at 7. He says, I'm sorry I'm late. And she says, oh, that's okay. And I know you probably had a lot to do. So his coming home late does not determine her emotional reaction directly. It's determined by how she, again, dreams it based on her circumstances, her filters, her dream of the moment. Right. She creates her emotional reaction using what he did, filtered through her dream. Mm -hmm. What I would call a trigger. <laughs> it triggered, yeah. you know. It's like it a triggered. Trigger. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But see, if the trigger's not there, then she has a different reaction, but it's not based right. on what he did. Absolutely. Yes, ex exactly. But it was through her own filters, yes. It wasn't his action, but it was her dream or you know, her exactly. belief, yes. He did not create her emotional reaction to his reality of being late. Right. She created it. Yes. This is like, whoa. We're, because it says we are not responsible for creating other people's emotional reactions. So when somebody says, I'm really angry with you, we know that they're dreaming us in a particular way based on their filters and their triggers, but it has nothing to do with us. They're describing their little virtual reality, their dream in their mind, with us in their, inside their head, distorted by their distorting their stored light. And when they're saying, you do this to me and you hurt me when you do this, they're describing the little one inside of their head. They're not talking about who we are. Because we already know that we are love. We are the divine messenger of love, God's love here, and she's so distorted us that she's seeing us as somebody who hurts him. Mm -hmm. If I'm walking down the street and I see my sweetheart holding hands with somebody who block ahead of me, you would expect me to be jealous, be angry, maybe run down there, maybe run home and cry, maybe run down there and leap on this usurper's back, you know, and drag him to the concrete recognizing just before he hits his head that that wasn't my sweetheart after all. Mm. Oops. Sorry. Or, or, and let's imagine the same thing happens, but I've been having an affair and, and really swept away by somebody else and I just haven't been able to tell my sweetheart yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I'm going to break the news to her. And then I see her walking down the street holding hands with somebody else and I go, yes. And that night I say, how could you do this to me? I'm done. Mock up a little indignation, but the truth is I have a completely different emotional reaction to exactly the same situation because of the difference in how I dream it. Right. And when we break this agreement, we're on our way to freedom because we are no longer trying to get it right for other people so we can get their love. Because now we know that we're the source of love in our lives the source of acceptance and approval. And now we don't have to get it right for other people and manage their emotional reality. We don't need, we're not creating it. They're dreaming. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have to fix it because we have respect for them to take care of themselves. So, in essence, what I hear you saying is that it's really about what our dream, let's just use the analogy of the male and the female, the partnership, um, uh -huh. It is 
my reality or my dream that I have about him, of what I foresee in this relationship or in him. And yes. when he would do something to um, disrupt that dream, then I am emotional. And it, you know what I mean? Then I right. get this, this emotional yes. reaction, so forth and so on. So what we need to, I don't know if need to do is the right language here, but what we need to recognize, I guess, is that what it is, it's our dream of how we perceive that person to be, whether it's in our relationship or whatever the situation is. Yes? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, so it's getting clarity that when something arises, it's because if you have this dream about how you think, you know, we should live in a white picket house and we have all these beautiful children and we're, you know, like the Ozzy uh, Ozzie and Harriet and so forth, mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's that's the dream that I have of when I'm marrying this person and that's the way life should be. But his dream of his relationship with me may not be that at all. It may be Correct. one very different from that. His dream of what a wife is, or how a wife should be. Um, right. Maybe his mother, his mother cooked every single meal for his father and was on the table when sure. he got home. So he assumes that that's what wife does, and so right. he comes right. home and you're playing tennis with your girlfriends, and and he takes it personally and 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 has an emotional reaction, and so he has an emotional reaction, and then he shares it with you, and then you have an emotional reaction, and it looks like you're creating other people's emotional reaction. The right. important thing to right. see is back to your corners, corollary, second agreement corollary to A is if I'm not responsible for creating other people's emotional reactions to my reality, I am responsible for creating my emotional reactions to other people's reality. Meaning? Meaning that when you've got dinner ready at 6 and he comes home at 7 and you have an emotional reaction, You've created that out of how you're dreaming, and it has nothing it. to do with what you did. Mm-hmm. So you, so there's no point in even sharing with him your emotional reaction, mm-hmm. blaming him for your emotional reaction, because mm-hmm. you've taken responsibility for creating yourself. Mm-hmm. And you, then you, you become the jaguar and you stalk, and that's one of the mm-hmm. tools in the Toltecs, and you stalk and you go inside and you say, what is my fear here? What am I afraid of? Oh, maybe he doesn't respect or love me enough to come home on time. Maybe he's giving his commodity of attention to somebody else. Maybe uh, he doesn't like my cooking. Maybe I'm not worthy of his love. Maybe, you know, da 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 go on and on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and those are all lies. Every one of those is a lie because you're perfect in your love itself. You don't have to be worthy of love your love. But when you can identify those lies, that's how you recognize you're responsible for creating your emotional reactions to his reality. And in an intimate relationship, the way I like to share it is to say, wow, when you came home late, I want to tell you and share with you about a part of myself that had an emotional reaction to that. And I'm not blaming you for it. I'm not saying you had anything to do with it. But because we have this intimate relationship and this agreement to do this, I just wanted to share what I went through when this happened. Mm. I got really angry. I felt hurt. And then when I stopped it and I went deeper, I found fear. And then I found all these things that I'm afraid of that it means that you think when you don't come home. And he starts to say, no, honey, that's not you. (laughs) I don't need that. I don't need you to talk me out of this fear. I will take care of that. That's a little child in me that was taught that she had to be worthy of love and capture this commodity by doing it right. And that's a lie that I'm still teaching her is a lie and I'm teaching her the truth. And I don't need you to try to talk me out of it or defend yourself or justify yourself or mm-hmm. tell me about the traffic or the boss. I would be interested in hearing how you feel when I share with you that I was afraid. So would it be beneficial for the for each person to say what their dream is about that person, no, about the relationship or whatever the situation, about your boss or, you know, mm-hmm. about you raising your child? 
Yeah, it's great stuff to write down. We we actually have a one of the tools in the in Toltec is we call it a mitote book, and, and that's where we write down everything the judge says, every belief, every agreement, mostly enforced by the judge and the pusher, uh, just for the information, just out of curiosity, no judgment about it. And just write it all down and take a look and go, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Look at the lies that I'm believing in. Because right. that's, that's a major tool in the mastery of awareness. And the three masters of the Toltec path, awareness being the first, you have to be aware of something before you can change it. Absolutely. And, and, and then comes the master of transformation, where you take all those lies and, and transform them into the truth. Mm. Fabulous. Hey, we've got five minutes. Um, before we step into the third agreement, let me just have you um, let people know how they can get a hold of you, because I want to continue on. And, um, but I want to be sure that you get that information out there. We can do it again at the very end, too. Okay, thank you. Um, my website is called joydancer.com, joydancer.com. And it's where we are dancing in joy with life. It has a lot of Toltec teachings. It has uh, calendars of my journeys and events. It has photo albums of places we go and things we do. It has articles. It has some audio. We're putting up a lot more audios of uh, teleclasses and, and audios like this one. We download that to the pages. I also have a, a, uh, a companion uh, website called TACO. T-A-C-O stands for the Toltec Apprentice Community Online. And it's an online community. And we've just totally redesigned the software and a lot of the features. And we have a thing now called My Taco Space, which is like a MySpace part of it, where people can put up blogs and picture albums and stuff to share with each other. And we're revitalizing that community as a, um, a spiritual social networking site. Mm-hmm. It, I am so excited about the new, the new life. It's about six years old, but it's completely new software, new technology, and a whole new way of bringing people together in community. You have a chat room and teleconferences with me, and and uh, and then people come together and do journeys with us and meet each other and have some beautiful relationships created out of the out of the online program and the journeys, and it's really sweet. And we do things like the summer celebration of life. We have our fourth annual coming up in Northern California in the first of August. 8th, 9th, and 10th, where we will gather together on a ranch out in the country in Northern California, just north of San Francisco, and and just celebrate love. We'll talk about these agreements, and we'll talk about the truth of love, and have workshops, and fire ceremonies to burn our old agreements, and, and then a beautiful Sunday morning ceremony called the Circle of Love to make all new agreements about love. So I do it in term, you know, in the Toltec tradition, in the pyramids, and more and more I'm doing it in terms of celebrations like our summer celebration of life and uh, the Valentine's workshop that I did here in Paradise in Chicago last few weeks ago. And so that's the best way to get in is through the Joy Dancer website. And then Joy Dancer, the it's all joydancer.com will take people to all of it. Yeah. Okay. And actually, the, just the other one is www.tacotaco.com. It, it's taco.joydancer.com. Oh, okay. So okay. going to Joy Dancer, there's a big link to taco on it. Oh, okay. Perfect. And I'm just putting together a new website called thenewrelationship.com also to focus more on my relationship teaching and things like the five agreements and men's work because women keep telling me that we got to get some men up to speed here. And <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So we got... Oh, and then my book is on the website too. The uh, the Everything Toltec Wisdom book. That book really lays out the story of the Toltec path and and the tools and and uh, I really encourage people who are listening to to find it. It's everywhere. It's in every bookstore everywhere. And, and it's online. It's on. We sell it on our website. We have a store on the website too. With the CDs of the Five Agreements and music and books and. Mexican artifacts and things. So, I really encourage people to 
to find that book and read it because it really lays out my version of not only the Toltec path, but just a general healing path that I think uh, people, are, people are liking and are finding it beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've got about one minute. So um, my question is, do you, we can um, talk about the third and fourth and fifth. We might have a time to go through all of them. Do you want to continue um, in another show to finish up? I, I think it would be great. Um, it's totally up to you. I know that your schedule is really busy, too. I would love to, Linda. I think it, I love talking about it, and I love people hearing it and, and, and getting in touch with me. I encourage people to go to the website and, or just write to me at alan at joydancer.com, A-L-L-A-N, at joydancer.com, and share their thoughts with me and their questions, their inspirations, and and we'll go from there. So, yeah, certainly we can't finish that today, but I think we've laid a good foundation for it. And oh, I'd absolutely. Love to oh, I think there's some great information given, and especially really recognizing, you know, about people uh, that they're dreaming their own dreams. You know, I mean, it's their dreams, and, you know, um, Lost what they're Talk Radio. So, definitely. I mean, if you have time tomorrow, we can definitely, um, I'm not sure what your schedule holds tomorrow, but, um, we can continue on tomorrow. It would be about 10 o'clock my time. I'm not sure of the difference between here and there. We're a Pacific Standard. What Are you? I'm an hour later. You're an hour later. Okay. So if that would work for you. I'm uh, going to be gone till about noon or 1. Okay. That would still work for me. We could do it after that. So 1 o'clock yeah. your time? Be, let's do it uh, 2 o'clock yours, right. 7 o'clock mine. 2 o'clock my time is great. Would that be recorded? Perfect. So anybody that's listening out there, because we're just, I mean, there, it does tape a little bit after that. Um, we're going to continue this show on the uh, five agreements for the new relationship tomorrow. It will be 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and I'll get that on the radio show today. So, But anyone who does want to get back in touch um, in the meantime with Alan, can do so at joydancer.com. So, Alan, thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, it's just, it was just a, a real pleasure, um, you know, listening and hearing all this information and really uh, resonating with me, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners also. Well, thank you for the opportunity, and it was sweet to be here with you. Great, and I'll go ahead and email you, and we'll be on again tomorrow. We'll okay. The, the topic tomorrow. And do you want to uh, do it for an hour and a half, or you want to? Because I don't know how we've got three, four, and five. So, you know, I, we could do longer than uh, an hour and a half. I think would be good to to do the rest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll go ahead and left. post it on there, and we'll do a continuation tomorrow. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks, Alan. Great. All right. I look forward Thank to talking you. to you again tomorrow. All right. Okay. Bye. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye. Napa no. A Napa guy knows that by the foot, there's no better ride than an old station wagon. Room for six people facing forward, two people facing backward, and a whole lot of luggage, lumber, and bicycles haphazardly strapped to the roof. If you can parallel park that beast, you can park anything. And with some quality parts and a little Napa know-how, you can keep your land ship running longer, stronger. It's not obsolete. It's a rare treasure. That's Napa know-how. Napa know-how. We're here at Aquatica, observing the locals. There, a little aquaticin waves to the flamingos, nods to the turtles, and bravely stares down a towering six-lane slide. And she's off. She's done it. Another race won. And now she's joining her family for a relaxing victory lap on the tropical Lazy River. And it's another wild day at Aquatica. Make your family an Aquaticin family and save up to $10 on a single day ticket. Aquatica, SeaWorld's water park. Limited time offer while supplies last. Online service fees apply.